Today, we're going to begin a brand new series for the month of February. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5 and Ephesians chapter 6 through this month. We've titled this series, Walk in Love, and, and we'll unfold why that is in just a moment. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Ephesians 5. If you need a Bible, come to the altar room after the gathering. It is a room we pray for people in who need prayer. So if you need prayer, please come. Also, we have Bibles, and we want to make sure everyone has a copy of God's Word. It, when we understand the book of Ephesians, I, I want to give some overview of what the book is so that we can understand the text where it sits in the book as a whole for us. Ephesians is a letter. It is a letter the Apostle Paul writes to believers in Jesus, the church, who live in a town, a city called Ephesus. And so he is writing a letter to them that they might have teaching and instruction of what they are to believe and how they are to behave, how they are to operate as the body of Jesus, as the body of Christ, as the church. And so when we read it, we can read it with that framework as well. The book of Ephesians is in three major parts, and the three major parts can be described with three words, and those three words are sit, walk, stand. So these are postures that we see actually in the book of Ephesians, and these postures help really give a title and a category to the sections. Let me explain it and help us understand where the passage we're going to be at fits in this three-part sit, walk, stand. Ephesians 1, 3 through 3, 21, so the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, that's the sit section. And the reason it's the sit section is because of Ephesians 2, 6. And God raised us up with him, with, with Jesus, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, so we are seated with God. We are seated with Christ. That is where we sit. So if you don't like where your seat is, you've got a better one, okay? It's seated with Christ. And that's the sit section. And when we understand our lives, we're to understand as a follower of Jesus in Christ, where we currently sit right now is we are seated with Christ. That's very important information, that that is where we sit. We are seated with Christ. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, 9, this is the walk section. This is actually the part where we will be teaching from in the month of February. It is the walk section because Ephesians 4, 1 says, therefore, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So we are seated with Christ, and because we are seated with Christ, how we walk should reflect that we are seated with Christ. So the way that we walk and go about our lives should be a reflection of the fact that we are sitting with God. We are seated with Christ. So sit, walk, and then the third section is stand. This is Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. We actually did a series on this passage last year. It was called Battle Ready. It is about the armor of God. It is about spiritual warfare and the battle that we are in, that we would engage in battle. In Ephesians 6, 11, it says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So sit, walk, stand. In the month of February, we're going to be in Ephesians 5 and the beginning of Ephesians 6, and it's in the walk section. And so we've titled the series for the month of February, Walk in Love. Walk in Love. And we'll see in our text why we've called it Walk in Love. But the four weeks that we're going to be looking at in this series, Walk in Love, this weekend we're going to be looking at Ephesians 5, 1 through 21. And today's text, it's about being an imitator of God. Being an imitator of God. Next weekend, Lord willing, we'll be looking at verses 22 through 24. That section is about wives. The following weekend, Lord willing, 25 through 33, that section is about husbands. And then when you turn into the new chapter, the first four verses, it's about children or parents in relationship to their children. And what I want to make note of is in the section we're going to look at today, being imitators of God, these first 21 verses, it explains how we are transformed in, in Christ. And because we are transformed in Christ, it impacts how we interact with one another. So because we, we model our life after God, it impacts these relationships, wives, husbands, and children. 
it's not just these three relationships it impacts. It impacts all of our relationships, though the passage is laid out with these three specific. So I want you to consider right now, what are the relationships you have? It may not match what's on the screen, but what are the relationships that you have? What are the relationships that you're engaged in? And I want to challenge you to bring those relationships to this text. Following Jesus should matter for our actual life. And so what are the actual relationships that you're in? When we look at this text about being imitators of God, it should impact. It should impact our relationships. So be thinking about these relationships as we look at this text. Let me pray. Father God, Lord, thank you for your word. It's pure and it's perfect and it's complete. It's whole. It lacks nothing. It accomplishes all. We can never search through it all and discover everything. And God, we need it desperately. So like a thirsty people who need water, would this be like a fresh drink this morning? Uh, like a hungry people who need a meal, would this be like bread, like a bread of life for us this morning? And so we engage, Lord, with your word and may it be like a nourishing meal to strengthen us, to build up the body. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. So our text, Ephesians 5, 1, it starts with this phrase, therefore, uh, be imitators of God. Be imitators of God, therefore. So because we're seated with Christ, because we sit with Christ and that's our position, let's be imitators of God. This is how we're going to walk. We're going to be imitators of God as beloved children. In Galatians, which is the letter previous to this one in order in our Bible, Galatians 4, 6, it says, and because you are sons or your, your children... God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. We're, we're to see God as our father. We, we, are, we are beloved children, and we're to see God as our father. And no matter what your parenting experience has been, you know, anytime we start talking about parents, we cannot help th but think about our parents or our lack thereof having parents, whatever our situation has been. But whether you have had a good parenting experience or you've had a poor parenting experience, parenting is redeemed in God and parenting is redeemed with the perfect parent and that is our heavenly father. And so when we come to this text and, and we talk about being beloved children, we have a perfect parent, our heavenly father who loves us, who loves us perfectly. He, he is good towards us and he has good for us and everything he's doing in our lives, he's working it out for our good and for him to be glorified in our lives. He, he is the perfect parent. And so as beloved children, we come and we see that we're to be imitators of God. So God is the standard. God's the standard and we're the church and the standard's God. So how can we as the church be faithful? Well, by being imitators. So how we as, as the body are faithful to be in the body is that we're going to be imitators of God. So God's the standard, and this is describing how we as the church can be faithful. So these are, as we walk through this passage, we can look at this as God's standards for faithfulness in the church. Think about it this way. God has saved me. He's saved me um, from my sin. He has saved me because of the cross of Jesus Christ and his blood shed. We're going to be having communion at the end of our time together today. He has saved me. So he saved me from hell. He has saved me for heaven. Now what? So God has saved me, but how should that matter for today? What, what should my life look like today because God has saved me? So therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. And then we get to this little phrase in, in Ephesians 5, 2 at the beginning. And it says, and walk in love and walk in love. And we've taken the, the name here and we've, we've applied it to the whole series and walk in love. So when we think about we're seated with Christ, how are we supposed to walk? How are we, how are we to be found faithful as the church to walk in love? This is standard number one, to walk in love. So let's look at this section from Ephesians 5, 2 through 7. It says, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice 
to God. So again, what's the standard? Christ is the standard, as Christ loved. So we're to walk in love as Christ loved us. And, and how did he love us? He gave himself up for us. So this is describing sacrificial action. What is love? Love is sacrificial action. And Christ is displaying love by displaying sacrificial action. And when I think about this, I think, you know, God, God describes how he loves us through sacrificial action. We see this in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. I'll read this to you from my Bible. It says, but God shows his love for us. So it's referencing the Father, now God the Father. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So God the Father is showing sacrificial action. And this verse is describing that Christ, the Son of God, God the Son, he is showing sacrificial action. So God the Father and God the Son are both displaying love towards us through sacrificial action. That's what it looks like to experience love. It's to experience sacrificial action. And then it says, and this is a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. And as you, you know, what is this term, fragrant offering? Well, if you read your Old Testament, like in the book of Leviticus, hey, our church family's reading through the Bible together. You could hop on, right, in the book of Leviticus. That would explain what this term is because the purpose of the fragrance is that God would find the sacrifice as pleasing aroma, that it would be a pleasing aroma to God. And so it's describing that Jesus, loving sacrificially through sacrificial action, is like a pleasing aroma to God. Um, when I was walking through the lobby, I, you know, I walked past children's ministry, and then I walked past the information center, and then I hit a wall of pleasing aroma, and it was coming from the coffee shop. <sighs> I like the smell of coffee. Well, God loves the smell of love, sacrificial action. And so we walk in love. And then it says how we should not live. So, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Okay, what does this mean? The key words here, I think, are be named. So let's just make this really practical. My name is Joel. Good morning. Um, what should be named about me? It should not be named about me, Joel and sexual immorality. Joel and all impurity. Joel and covetousness. It, it shouldn't even be named about me because I have a different name and my name is Saint. Joel, he's a saint. Now, my mother never said that, but you know, um, uh, 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 that's what's true about my life. Because I'm seated with Christ. And so I'm going to walk in love. And what's going to be named about me is what's true about me. And that I belong to Jesus. I'm in his family. And I'm to live like what I am, which is a saint. Someone who belongs to Christ. There, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead... Let there be thanksgiving. So all of these things that are, are being described as negative in this passage, that's not the only option you have. That, this is where the world is going to drag you into, but that's not the only option for our lives. There's another option. But instead, but instead, let there be thanksgiving. So I'm to be named, I'm seated with Christ, and I'm in Christ, and, and that's where my name belongs. My name belongs with Jesus, and I am a saint, and instead of these other things, these other things that the world wants to draw me into, instead, I'm to live out of an incredible place of thanksgiving, giving thanks to God because I belong to him, because I'm seated with Christ. And because I'm seated with Christ, it impacts how I walk, and so I walk in love. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So this passage is explaining it from a negative context, has no inheritance, so it's using it in a negative so that we can understand the positive. So what is the positive? Well, the positive is that when you're named with Christ and you're a saint and you're living in thanksgiving to what God has given you, you have this incredible inheritance. 
And that inheritance is the kingdom of Christ and God. No matter how much your mommy and your daddy have and they decide to leave you, there is no inheritance that will ever match the inheritance of Christ. There is no inheritance on planet Earth. There is no worldly inheritance that will ever match the inheritance in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of Christ. We are seated with Christ and we are walking in love, understanding that we have an inheritance with him. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Deception is empty. There is no substance. There's nothing that fills it. It's empty words. Deception is empty. There's no content in deception. It's empty. It's empty words. And we find that where there is disobedience to Christ. Therefore, do not become partners with them. That word partners here, I think, is a very important word. Remember, what what are the partnerships that we've already seen? Well, we've seen a partnership with God the Son and God the Father. God the Father shows sacrificial action. God so demonstrates his love. He shows his love. But while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ shows a sacrificial action. He gave himself up for us as a fragrant aroma, a pleasing aroma, a sacrifice to God. So God the Father and God the Son are in a partnership of showing love to us, and they're doing that through sacrificial action. And then where do we come in? Well, we're called as beloved children. So as beloved children, we're now receiving the love that God is giving. And so we're now, we're now in partnership with God because we're receiving his love the sacrificial action that he has given towards us. And so we're in partnership with him. What's this verse describing? It's saying all these other things, that's not your partnership. Your partnership is not with the world. Your partnership is not with all these other negative things. Your partnership's with God. That's where your partnership is. That's where your partnership is. Your partnership is with Jesus. So remember who your partner's with. Don't don't become partners with someone else. That's not who your partner's with. If you're in Christ, your partnership is Christ. And so we're seated with Christ, and so we're going to walk like it. We're going to walk in reflection of where we're seated. We're seated with Jesus Christ. Walk in love. So maybe I'll sum it up this way. Walk in love because you are beloved children. So when, where, how, why. Walk in love because you are beloved children. You you need to let it sink into your mind and your heart what is true about me in Christ. I am a a beloved child. I am a beloved child of God. And it's out of a place of being a beloved child that I now walk as I am, which is I'm going to walk as a beloved child. I'm going to walk in love. So that's standard number one. It goes on in verse eight to describe a next part, walk as children of light. So we are beloved children, and now it's describing us not only as beloved children, but also as children of light. Walk as children of light. And this is where we get the second standard, walk in light. Walk in light. It says, for at one time you were darkness. Do you see that description? Let that sink in. You were darkness. Darkness. What used to be true about my life? I was darkness. What used to be true about us before we're in relationship with Christ? We are darkness. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. This is describing a transformation. And the transformation is right here. Light in the Lord. That's the transformation. Christ is transforming our lives. And remember what we talked about at the beginning of being imitators of God, and it's going to impact wives and husbands and kids. It's going to impact all of our relationships, especially our relationships in the body of Christ. You are light in the Lord. You are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light for the fruit of light. That's an interesting phrase. When I think of light, I don't think of light as having fruit. But the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. I was asked last week if I could write a paragraph that would describe an ideal relationship. 
I had never been asked that question before. That was, I've never had somebody ask me, please write a paragraph that describes an ideal relationship. I'm like, wow, that is a really good question. We could all probably use a cheat sheet, right? That has the paragraph of ideal relationship on it. Probably help us all out a little bit, right? And so I gave it some thought and I kept thinking about it and I kept thinking about it. And I don't know if this is the right answer, but it's the answer I came up with and it's the answer I'm gonna give you to that question. In my Bible, it says in Galatians 5, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Man, if there are relationships that are operating like that, I'm thinking they're probably ideal. They're probably ideal. Let me explain a little bit here. I've never had somebody tell me, Joel, you know what? You just love too much. Can you stop loving so much? It's really annoying how much you love. Or I've never had somebody say, Joel, you know what? Could you bring the joy meter down a little bit? You're way too high on the joy meter, starting to really bug me, right? Can you just bring that joy down a little bit and be a little more sorrowful? That'll work out better for our relationship. Or I've never had somebody say, you know what, joy, Joel, you just have too much peace. Joel, there's so much peace about you. There's a calm about you. Could you get a little bit, you know, more tumultuous? Could you just, you know, get a little bit more bumpy on the road? Like, there's just too much peace in your life. I've never had somebody tell me, you know what, Joel? You, were, you have been too patient with me. Could you get a little bit more frustrated with me, please? Could you get a little bit more impatient with me, please? That would really help our relationship. I've never had anybody say, you know what, Joel? This whole kindness bit you're doing, I'm seeing right through it, right? This whole kindness thing, if you could just not be so kind, that would be really great. Like throw a little rudeness in there instead. You know, I've never had somebody say, you know what, Joel, you know, goodness, you know, goodness isn't really working out for us. Goodness isn't working out for our relationship or or, Joel, Joel, faithfulness. Could you be a little flakier, please? Could you tell me something and then not do it instead? You know, could you give me a promise and then not come through? Joel, I'd really think that would help our relationship. Or how about gentleness? Joel, too much power under control. Too much power under control. That's not really working for our relationship. Or self-control. You know what, Joel, could you just lose control a little bit more? I think it would really spice up our relationship. You know, it would really help us out. Against such things, there is no law. That's a pretty good paragraph for an ideal relationship. And it is described as what? It's described as the fruit of the spirit. Okay, we'll take that fruit. Let's come back to this text. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And we need to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. In fact, we're going to look at that in the next section as we go through. In verse 10, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. When I saw this text, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord, I actually thought, I wonder how many times I've tried to figure out how much can I actually get away with? Like, how far can I go before it's too far? How close to the line can I get without falling over the edge? Oh, I'm the only one who's thought like that. Okay, that's cool. Um, But I I was like, wow, maybe I need to do a little bit more work instead of trying to figure out how much I can get away with, with Lord, how can I discern what is pleasing to you and have my focus be on pleasing you instead of pleasing myself? Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. Two words really stick out to me. One is unfruitful. That's a very negative word. Unfruitful. Shameful. That's a very negative word. Those two words right there, unfruitful and shameful. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible hadn't thought about this for a while, but I used to think about God as having like a flashlight in his hand. And I would ask God, Lord, would you take your flashlight and would you shine it into the dark, you know, crevices and cracks of my heart so that you can expose the darkness of my heart? And so I would ask God, God, shine your flashlight, shine it right on that dark spot that I don't want anybody to know about. I don't want to tell anybody about, I'm, you know, I'm afraid, you know, 
people are going to find, God, would you shine your flashlight right on that dark spot in my heart? But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This phrase here, arise from the dead, think unfruitful. That, that phrase, unfruitful, man, death is unfruitful. Think shameful. Death is shameful. And Christ will shine on you. Remember, remember, we're children of light. We're children of light. And this is describing death, arise from the dead, and it's describing life. Christ will shine on you. Our life is in Jesus Christ. So we have this second standard, walk in light. We have walk in love. We have walk in light. Remember, we're seated with Christ. How is that supposed to impact our daily life? How can we be faithful as God's church? We're going to walk in love. We're going to walk in light. And then we get to verse 15. It says, walk not as unwise, but as wise. So we're imitators of God as beloved children, as children of life. And now we're adding wise. We're adding wise. So standard number three is walk in wisdom and sobriety. And this text, this next part of the text is going to address both those subjects, wisdom and sobriety. It says, verse 15, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. I would like to share a little bit about my personal life and experience that would hopefully help to illustrate well the importance of this text. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. So I have a kid or few. And, um, oh, thank you, my friend. Thanks, Mike. I have a, I have a kid or few. And, um, and my youngest child is six years old. And, and she needs lots of extra help. And so we give lots of extra help. And I'm in the process right now of teaching my six-year-old how to walk to school. And this is how the process is going. So we get out of the car, and I say, hey, let's walk to school. And she says, no. And, and then she goes like this, right? And she wants me to carry her. And so I'm now the one doing all the walking in the walking to school. And as I carry her, she does not participate in the carrying process. She doesn't do her part in the hold one another process. Maybe you can understand what I'm saying. Her arms are flinging, and her head's flinging. And so I kind of have to, like, wrap myself around her as I'm carrying her. And then her mug is like right up in my face, right? And so I'm trying to carry her as we walk to school. And I'm finding that it's very difficult to see because her head's in the way, right? So I, I have to keep going like this and looking down as I'm carrying my six-year-old who is teaching me how to walk to school. And, you know, and so I don't trip on the curb, right? So I, I don't hit the curb. Right? You know, I'm looking at the four-way stop. I'm looking for the cars, right? I'm having to mo keep moving her back. And I'm, every step matters, right? Well, it gets even more precarious when we are at our home and we are upstairs. And I'm like, all right, baby girl, we're going to walk downstairs. And she goes, no, we're not. You know, and, and she's like this. And I'm like, okay, we're going to walk downstairs together, right? And, and I'm going to do the walking. So I pick her up and I hold her. And I realize in this moment, this is like dangerous because I'm trying to go downstairs and her head's in my way, right? So I keep moving it and I got pressed. She is precious cargo. Little precious cargo. She's precious cargo. So I keep looking down and she's laid, she's, she's put bombs on the step for me to step on. There's toys all the way down the step. She thought she prepared. She prepared ahead. She knew exactly what she was doing. And so I'm, I'm like, man, this is dangerous. I, it, I make one Wrong step here, and we got bad news. Like, every step matters as I'm carrying my little pumpkin pie down the stairs. Are you with me? Okay. What does this text say? Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Every step matters. In the career profession that I am in, there is a saying that we have. And the saying is, we are all one bad decision away from being on the front page of the newspaper. Every step matters. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Every step matters. 
making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Did you know that you have to put zero effort in for time to go by? You should try it sometime. Just sit back, relax, do nothing. The clock's going to do its job. It's going to keep working. The clock's going to keep working whether you're working or not. You, it takes you no effort to pass time. You have the same amount of minutes I have. It's not a matter of do we have enough time or not enough time. We all have the same amount of time until God says our time is done here. And then we talk about a different type of time with him for eternity. But we all have the same amount of time. The issue is how are we using it? How are we using the time? It says make the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish but understand the will of the Lord. Understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. So the question I think comes here as we talk about walking in wisdom and sobriety, a question I think we have to ask is, who or what is controlling my life? Who or what is controlling my life right now? When we talk about do not get drunk with wine, that is a very specific example I do not think it's the only example that matters. I think there, you can take that principle and ask, who or what is controlling my life? Is there some other thing that is controlling my life? Is there someone that's controlling my life? And if we get to an answer regarding who or what that's controlling our life, and it is not Jesus, it's the wrong thing. Any answer besides Jesus for who or what is controlling my life is the wrong controlling agent. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So it is, it is Christ's work to set us free. And so we don't want to enslave ourselves to anyone or anything because Christ has already done the work to set us free. So who should be controlling our life? Well, in Galatians 5, it goes on to describe that. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For they are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Which leads us to verse 18, which is, but be filled with the Spirit. But be filled with the Spirit. So this brings us to standard number four, walk in God's spirit. We've talked about walking in love, walking in light, walking in wisdom and sobriety, now walking in God's spirit. And remember, all of this, all of this is as a result because we're seated with Christ. Because that's what's true. We're seated with Christ, and so we're going to live like it. Standard number four, walk in God's spirit. Verse 18, but be filled with the spirit. Remember, um, the deception is empty words, that part, deception is empty words. Okay, so that's what it is to be empty. It's to live in deception. But to live with God, to live with truth, is to be full. And, and we're going to be full of the Spirit. And when we're full of the Spirit, it's going to transform our lives. Remember, we talk about transforming our lives. It's going to impact our relationships, all relationships, especially our relationships with the body of Christ. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another. So how we interact with one another is going to change. We're going to address one another in Psalms. And hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Where else do you go with a group of people where you sing together? That's not negative. This is very special. We actually come together and sing together. And it's not just singing together. We're worshiping the Lord. We are giving praise out loud. We're literally singing out loud to the Lord. This is very special, what we come together and do. And dress one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Through the next few weeks, we're going to talk about this idea of submitting this is super unpopular in our culture. That's where we're going. And I want to make a very important note here from this text that if we try to have submission and it is not out of reverence for Christ, it will always lead to a disaster. 
It is submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Reverence for Christ is the key that we would live in reverence for Christ. And because we are living in reverence for Christ, it will impact our relationship with wives, husbands, children, people we work with, people we're in the community with, other family members, other friends. It is out of reverence for Christ. It's going to be a, it's going to be a good adventure that we're going, to, we're going to take over these next few weeks. But we need to really embrace having reverence for Jesus as we do it. We're going to enter into a time of remembering the Lord. We've talked about being imitators of God. Well, Christ has asked us to remember him. And so we want to obey that command in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 23. And we're going, to, we're going to take this idea of having reverence for Christ into this passage as we, as we enter into have communion together. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember, Remember that phrase, out of reverence for Christ. Well, when we come into a time of communion, we're to have reverence for him. We're to be doing this in remembrance of him. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So out of reverence for Christ, we're going to remember his blood that has been shed for us in remembrance of him. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So when we celebrate communion, we're celebrating Christ's death on the cross. We're celebrating his resurrection. We're also proclaiming he's coming back. He's coming back. And out of reverence for Christ, we're proclaiming he's coming back. And whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So we need to take some time to do business with God. We need to be asking God, Lord, is there anything you want to show me in my life? Is there anything you want to bring to my attention about my speech, my attitudes, my action, my relationships? Is there anything you want to make me aware of right now? And so there's going to be a song while the elements are being passed out. I would ask you just to hold on to the elements and do some examination with the Lord and ask God, is there anything he wants to bring to your attention? And if he brings something to your attention, then it would be wise to deal with the Lord on that right then. Whatever it is that he brings to your attention. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are but when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So I'm going to invite the communion team to go ahead and prepare to serve at this time. They're going to hand out the elements during this next song. When you receive those elements, hold on to them. We're going to take them together. I'm going to come back up. We're going to take them together. But I just want to encourage you, consider. Do some examination and consider. What does the Lord want to put on your heart right now? And whatever the Lord puts on your heart, I would encourage you, respond to the Lord with whatever it is that he puts on your heart. Father God, Lord, may this be a time where we have great reverence for Christ. Would we remember you? Lord, would we be humble enough to receive whatever it is that you want to do in our lives right now? And so God, help us to be in a place of humility so that we might be ready to engage with you in prayer and discernment and to hear from you. And I pray this in Jesus' name and all God's family said, amen.